Thank you, Brett. And uh, I agree. I couldn't echo it more. Happy to be here in front of a, an audience uh, and seeing everybody this morning uh, talking about hurricanes. And that maybe not something we want to think about, but we have to every year here in Galveston for sure. So uh, for those of you all that have been in hurricane country for a while, you know every storm is different. Harvey was a lot different than Ike. How many of you all were here for Hurricane Ike in 2008? So you know what a surge producer Ike was. And uh, many of you all may know that if Ike had come in just a little bit more left than it did, we probably would have had at least five more feet of surge. So uh, now Harvey was a whole different animal. Uh, we actually had people evacuating to the coast for Harvey in some cases because the inland parts of Galveston County were getting four feet of rain and more. Uh, that was all about flooding rains. Uh, but every storm is some combination of the hazards we see, we see here. Storm surge, damaging winds, flooding rains, tornadoes, and we could add high surf to that as well. Uh, you know, it's not a good thing to, to be in the water, obviously, uh, when we've got one of these storms. So the question is, what of these hazards is the most deadly? And a lot of people think hurricanes win. Uh, but it's really the water-related hazards. It's your storm surge, it's your flooding rains. And there's an old expression, run from the water, hide from the wind. And the idea there is you get people out of the surge zones. You get them out of uh, areas where the, the water hazards can take their lives. And so certainly here in Galveston, we're in that surge zone and we have to be really, really on our game uh, to get people out of harm's way ahead of the storm if we can. Uh, and and uh, you can see wind is only about, the pie chart there represents the percentage of fatalities from each hazard. So about half are due to storm surge flooding, a little over a quarter are due to flooding rains, and only 8% due to the winds. So where are we in the hurricane season? Here we are in late May, uh, typically May, June, and even the first part of July, there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, you'll hear in the media talk of the dust off Africa and how things are quiet and all that. Uh, but all of a sudden, uh, once we get to August, the switch gets turned on and you'll see more and more storms start to pop there uh, in the Atlantic. We can get, however, June storms. Uh, Tropical Storm Allison, a great example, early June 2001. And we almost had a storm just last week. It would have been our first May uh, tropical uh, cyclone to hit the uh, Texas coast, but it didn't quite get its act together in time. So I don't think anyone was too disappointed about that. So, uh, and that's what that uh, chart shows. It, it's sort of a timeline on the lower axis there going from May to November. And you can see that peak in, uh, in around September 10th and how we ramp up uh, as we go through the month of August. Here in Texas, if we can get beyond, say, mid-October, we're usually in good shape because those late season storms in late October and November, they tend to recurve uh, back off to the west before they reach the western Gulf. So uh, when you've got a hurricane, uh, you know, you hear that category, Cat 1 through Cat 5, you know, what is it today? It's usually the, le the headline on the newscast. It's a Cat 2. And, and we had this challenge with Ike because it was a Cat 2, Category 2, on the, on the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. Um, and, and so a lot of people thought, well, it doesn't sound that bad. Two on a scale of one to five doesn't sound that bad. But it, we, were, we were briefing, you know, 110 mile per hour winds in storm surge 15 feet or greater, uh, life threatening storm surge. That's what we were trying to get out, but a lot of people, even here on the island, uh, we're saying, we're thinking, it's a two, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't do much for a two, you know, and, and so we were really kind of racking our brains there trying to get that word out. And so after Hurricane Ike, the word wind was actually added to this scale. It used to be known as the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Scale, now it's the Hurricane Wind Scale, because that's what it represents. It gives you an idea of the wind hazard, not everything about the storm. So a large Category 2 can give you a surge like a smaller Category 4, for example, and Ike was a huge hurricane. And so, uh, so I think many of you all who were here for Ike remember that whole dilemma. You know, it's a 2, and some people were even saying it's just a 2, 
and, and you know that was just kind of driving us crazy. So trying to get that word out uh, to, to, to that this is not an overall severity scale, it's really a wind scale. So uh, just looking back uh, at Hurricane Ike, I can't believe that's 2008. Uh, I was actually new to the Houston Galveston area at that time, and I had told my family, you know, when we get to this office, uh, we'll probably catch a major hurricane. And, you know, unfortunately, that was true. Uh, so my family, we moved into our house in League City, and then that same week, we boarded up the house uh, and, and sent my young family off uh, to evacuate. But you can see the uh, radar image here of Hurricane Ike. Uh, did anyone ride Ike out uh, here on the island or even nearby, even nearby? So uh, you remember this is the early morning hours, uh, Saturday morning, uh, September 13th, I believe. And uh, the center of Ike, I don't know if you can tell there, is over Galveston Bay at this hour. Uh, our weather office in League City was in the eye of the storm, uh, as was, of course, the, this part of the island. And, Sure enough, I can verify the winds go calm in the eye of the storm. That's what all the meteorologists did. You know, when the eye is overhead, what are you going to do? You're going to go out and experience the eye of a hurricane. You can't do that every day, right? And so uh, it got to the point where my boss was looking around the ops area saying, where is everyone? You know, we have a hurricane going on, and a lot of us were out in the parking lot. Uh, and sure enough, calm winds in the eye of the storm. But it's that ring around the eye, that donut I have shaded there. That's the eye wall. That's the most dangerous part of the hurricane in terms of the wind. That's where the highest winds are, are, are found, in the eye wall. So with Hurricane Ike, we had that, because you have a counterclockwise circulation in the hurricane, we started off with a strong northeast wind on the, on the front side of the storm, and then the winds went calm, and then the winds were just as strong, if not stronger, from the west. Uh, on the south side of the storm as it pulled away. And think about what that does to the water. Uh, initially, uh, we had a northeast to southeast wind actually, pushing water into the bay, onto the coast. We have that tremendous wave action. You all have seen the, the waves crashing on the seawall. And then we shift the wind. So kind of what it did is, think of the Gal Galveston Bay as a big bathtub. It piled water up on the western part of the bay, and then all of a sudden, the winds shifted from the west, and so it kind of sloshed like that. We call it a seiche. And so then Chambers County, all of a sudden, they had that water rise about 10 or 11 feet in about 30 minutes as, as the water literally sloshed to the other side of the bay. So storm surge is such a very, very dangerous thing. The other thing I point, want to point out there as far as the anatomy of the hurricane are those spiral bands on the right-hand side there. That's where you're going to find some gusty winds, very heavy rain, and possibly tornadoes as well. And for Harvey, which made landfall well down the coast, uh, down uh, toward Rockport, it was those spiral bands that gave us the very, very heavy downpours and tornadoes. So different parts of the storm give you different hazards. Just looking back at Hurricane Ike, for those that were here, you remember this. Uh, the island was pretty much flooded. Uh, the seawall did its job on the, on the Gulf side. It actually protected the island as it was designed to do. Still amazing that could be built uh, back uh, just after the 1900 storm, a tremendous engineering feat, and uh, still doing its job. But we had, of course, uh, flooding from the bay side and also on the west end. Uh, Bolivar was hit the worst. Uh, because the worst of the surge is going to be near the track and to the right. Now, that center tracking over the bay uh, actually worked well for us, believe it or not. If it had come in, say, near San Luis Pass, we would have had uh, several more feet of surge right here on the island. Um, but uh, you can see the images there, uh, the flooding and the waves crashing on the seawall, uh, kind of an amazing time. Hard to believe that was 2008. Now looking at, uh, so that's all about storm surge and, and high surf. Uh, that was what Ike was all about. Harvey, if you're in Rockport, you're catching the eye wall of a category four storm. Ike was a category two. So the winds here on the island were on the order of 90 miles per hour. 
With this storm, we were getting 150 miles per hour. So if we get a high category storm coming directly in, we, we have that to deal with. Now, last year, Hurricane Laura was a real close call for us. If you remember, Laura was pointed at us and then turned at the last minute up into Lake Charles. That was the type of storm we haven't seen here in a long time, uh, a Category 4 hurricane. Uh, the 1900 storm, for reference, was a Category 4 storm. So, um, but for the folks in Rockport, they caught those 150 mile per hour winds. And in a case like that, you have a lot of wind damage as well, as you see in the photos there. Hurricane Ike, for them it was high winds and surge. For us it was what? It was heavy rain in over a huge area, including inland areas. Now when I came to this office from Virginia, North Carolina, you know, we had hurricanes back there and I told folks, yeah, we had 12 inches of rain from Hurricane Isabel, or no, Hurricane Floyd. And they said, that's nice, Dan, but here we measure rain in feet, not inches. And so Hurricane Ike, Amazing, or excuse me, Hurricane Harvey, amazingly, was a five feet, five foot rain storm. Nederland, Texas had 60 inches of rain. That's an all time record for uh, the continental US from a tropical cyclone. And uh, a lot of that came that Saturday night where we had over 20 inches of rain in just uh, several hours. But uh, this was not, again, this is a different storm than a lot of people had in their imagination. You know, we, we were briefing catastrophic flooding 40 inches or greater that was actually in our weather briefing before the storm and people just couldn't envision what that would look like and kind of amazingly it was it was that amount of rain and more over a huge area so that's all about flooding rains and so the point I'm again trying to emphasize is that every storm is different so one thing uh, we want to do as individuals uh, as a unit here is uh, determine our risk determine our family's risk. You know, where I live, you know, am I in a storm surge zone? Am I in an evacuation zone? Um, am I in a flood risk zone from heavy rain? What kind of winds can my home withstand? And you, know, you could apply that to your, your business as well. So that's something we want to do this time of year. And uh, it may be a bit hard to see, but what I'm going to show you now is sort of a worst case storm surge flood map four different categories. So think about an Ike, a large category two in that case, and that might give you your worst case category two map. And it may be hard to see here, but uh, for a category one, you can see the parts of the island that start to take on water, a worst case direct hit category one, uh, mainly on the bay side, even, even a few feet of water here at the port. And then we can go up the uh, scale, this is a worst case category two. Uh, the yellows there are greater than, uh, greater than uh, six feet of water above ground. So this is kind of like you had a Hurricane Ike come in uh, just to our left down the coast. This is the type of surge you might see. And we saw these surges uh, in some of these areas, uh, several feet of water above ground. I think there's even a high water mark here at the, at the, at the uh, port somewhere. I, I can't remember where exactly it is. Uh, so, you know, we're getting several feet of water with the two. Uh, but, you know, God forbid we get a, a, a Cat 3 version of Ike coming in just down the coast of us. You know, and now we're looking at greater than 10 feet of water uh, in this area and in much of uh, Galveston Island, excluding the highest parts of the island. Uh, another amazing part of Galveston history is the whole island was actually raised uh, after the 1900 storm. So if you think about Galveston back then, it was in some cases 10 feet lower on the seawall side than it is now. Uh, so just again, uh, acknowledging that engineering feat uh, from back in the day. And then, you know, God forbid, category four, all those areas in red there are greater than 10 feet of water above ground. So a huge area impacted and uh, a huge population impacted. So, you know, the idea is to get people out uh, ahead of that. Now, remember from Mike as well, the surge comes up early. It comes up maybe 24, 36 hours before the winds. And so we had uh, really hundreds of people that intended to leave Friday morning, but they were stuck and had to be airlifted out of places like Bolivar. So 
you know, plant that in the back of your mind as well, that if you do need to evacuate, it's best to get out early. So let's look back quickly on 2020 uh, and what a season it was. A record uh, season, 30 named storms, never had anything that high. Uh, the closest was 2005. That was the year we had Rita and Katrina, if you remember that. Uh, after that, there's no storm, no season similar at all. And as you know, we actually had to go into the Greek alphabet. Uh, if, if we have more than 21 named storms, we have to roll out the uh, Greek alphabet, at least as of last year. And especially look at the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's, it, it was, it was uh, the busiest I've, anyone's ever seen. The, a record number of storms in the Gulf, a record number of uh, Gulf Coast landfalls. Uh, and so on top of everything else last year, uh, we had a record hurricane season. And like I say, it could have been a lot worse for us here uh, because we had a lot of near misses. And um, unfortunately for Louisiana folks, uh, a lot of those ended up curling up into Louisiana. They had four landfalls there uh, and were impacted by at least six storms. So uh, the question is, what about this year? How far are we going to go down that list? We've already had Anna, believe it or not. Uh, that was a storm well out over the Atlantic um, last week. So it didn't really impact anyone. Those are the best, best kind. Uh, so we have already can cross one off the list. You can see the names for this year, uh, 2021. Those names will be used again in 2027. The, name, the list is repeated every, every seventh year. And uh, unless the storm has a huge impact, in which case the name is retired. So no more Hurricane Loras, uh, no more Ikes, uh, but you can see the list there. Uh, one change this year, if we go beyond the, the, the W storm, which would be Wanda, uh, we will not use the Greek alphabet anymore. Uh, you know, there, is a, there are some interesting issues when you have to retire a Greek letter, and, and that happened last year. So starting this year, uh, they'll pull from an alternate list uh, of names. But let's not do that again. So anything out there today? Uh, uh, one thing I do recommend is staying aware of what's going on in the tropics, really starting now, uh, right through October. So let me take a quick look. No, nothing out there today. Uh, this is on hurricanes.gov. It's the graphical tropical weather outlook. And what, what this is, the Hurricane Center looks at all the, the Atlantic and the, uh, and the Gulf and tries to identify any disturbances that have the potential to develop into tropical depressions or storms and then eventually hurricanes. And it assigns a percent chance of development. And so uh, check out hurricanes.gov. Get familiar with it. This will give you that little extra lead time you need perhaps to make preparations. Uh, maybe the storm hasn't developed yet, but there's a likelihood it will. You can already take action based on this, this information. Getting to the season's forecast, first I want to say one other change this year is the normal, the normal numbers uh, have gone up. Every 10 years, we shift our 30-year window of averaging. And so starting in 2021, we're including 2010 through 2020, including last year's super active season. So what that's done is it's raised the averages for an, uh, an average season. It used to be 12 named storms, which includes hurricanes and tropical storms. Now it's 14. It used to be six hurricanes. Now it's seven. And then major category three or higher are still at three. So again, the averages have come up. So what are we looking at this year relative to those new averages? Uh, forecast is for most likely an above average season. Now, one thing we do in the weather service, we use a lot of chances and percentages and ranges. Sounds a bit like a hedge, right? So, but uh, we're going with a 60% chance of above average, 30% uh, chance of near average. And what I'm really pulling for is that 10% chance of below average, but I wouldn't count on that. Uh, and so that's the forecast. You can see the, 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 the number of named storms forecast to be 13 to 20. Uh, remember, last year we had 30, so if you want to look at the bright side, that's fewer than that. Uh, but it still is above our average season. Um, the other thing to point out is no matter how many storms we get, it only takes one to make a, an active year for us. So 
In some ways, this forecast doesn't matter. We have to prepare the same way no matter what those numbers are uh, because a direct hit means an active year for us uh, here in uh, coastal Texas. And the other thing I would encourage you to do, uh, stay informed. You know, Brett's going to push out uh, information. Great about that. Our partners really are. Uh, Laura from Galveston County is here also. And it's our job to give you the weather information. Uh, you need to make decisions. You know, so that's our lane. And, and you know, Brett is good about asking questions. That's what, why we're there. Uh, we're on, on duty 24-7. Uh, to try to give you the information you need to make the decisions here at the port uh, for your family uh, and so on. So, you know, take advantage of that. Uh, that's, that's our lane. And connect with official sources. You can see our website there, our social media. Uh, the port uh, has, is, has uh, sources as well, your local emergency management. And, uh, and so that's all I have. The next presenter we have is going to be really quick, but I think it is, as I mentioned, very relevant. Uh, possibly to uh, many of our tenants and the people that are watching online here. Um, you may know him uh, by day as our systems integrator, uh, but at, by night he's a member of the Galveston Economic Development Partnership. And they have a new program that they're rolling out for business continuity and also to assist with getting grants and federal funding, or excuse me, state's funding um, for certain issues that pop up during emergency situations, similar, similar to a hurricane. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over really quick to Keith Palmer. Let them come on up here and tell us what they have started. Thank you, Brett. Well, as Brett said, um, a lot of you know me um, as an IT contractor, but I'm also with the Galveston Economic Development Partnership. And um, unfortunately, as we've discussed today, storms are inevitable. It, hopefully it won't happen this year, but we will eventually have another storm. And as a result, then there's going to be a recovery process. And although what we were talking about earlier, the Coast Guard, um, you know, the um, post-storm operational assessment is, is actually something that they're um, involved with as is port staff. But on your local level, your local officials and the Galveston Economic Development Partnership really needs to get um, some information from the businesses about the economic impact. Because that economic impact is actually what determines whether there's a declar disastrous declaration. And so the disaster declaration is based on the local officials in coordination with the GEDP and others actually making that initial assessment. Well, in the past, the way that economic impact assessment was done was very unscientific. It was basically just go out there, look around, see what you know, they, they basically <coughs> believe the, you know, a, a guesstimate of what the economic impact is. And so the GEDP partnered with Verity to come up with a economic impact assessment portal and um, all um, businesses are invited whether you're a member of the GEDP or not to to register with the economic impact assessment portal and what this portal will do is in, in the event of a storm you can basically create an impact case as to what that storm's impact has had on your business whether it's you know, you have had to close down, you've had um, to lay off employees, you've had damages and so forth. With that data being submitted to um, in that portal and so forth, all of the data is then aggregated. And then the local officials have a much more scientific information as to what has been the physical impact, what has been the economic impact of um, lost businesses and so forth. So very quickly, let me just go through this um, and I'll show you some of the um, the slides associated with it. And so, again, this is just basically what I was talking about is be prepared for what's next. And so what we're asking you to do is to basically go ahead and register on this portal and you'll basically create your business and then the event of a storm, then, that, then the, the portal will send you an, an, um, a notice that the incident's been created and then you can start your impact case and so forth. And so if you had to close down in the um, to evacuate, then that's the initial entry into your impact case. When you come back and you assess that you've had um, in, um, damages to your infrastructure and so forth, that's an additional um, to that same impact case. And so who it helps? It helps the um, economic development organization, it, um, as I've been discussing, um, to give them the ability to give more accurate data to the, 
to the local officials. It helps the emergency management coordinators because it facilitates better communication with the businesses and the businesses have the ability to communicate with the emergency managers. It, it, um, it helps the elected officials because then again, they are working with much more accurate data. And then the business owners have the ability to have access because the sooner that there's a disaster declaration declared in the event that it's appropriate to do so, then that becomes the, um, the pivotal tool to get um, resources, um, whether it's state, federal, and other sources. And so, um, again, and, and one of the big um, aspects here is, is this data is real time. And so as we go through the recovery process, the initial impact, can, you can update your impact case as you go through. And so um, you may not initially know exactly what all your insurance proceeds are going to be or what, exactly what your your damages to your to your facility are, but you are able to update it as you go through. Um, and so again, the, um, you know, this is how the the system assists the business owners and elected officials. Um, and it, it again, it walks through the whole stages of um, an incident from preparation to response to recovery. And so, what, you know, really where the focus here is in the recovery phase, but it's um, by going, what we're asking now is um, in your preparation stage to go ahead and, um, and register your business, create it so that then you're familiar with the portal, and then the event that, um, that there's an incident, then you're able to create your impact case. And this is a couple examples of how that data gets aggregated. And so up in the upper slide, it'll actually geo-reference all of the um, the businesses that have been impacted. So the, um, the local officials can see whether the storm surge just hit on the eastern tip of the island and there were more businesses that were there than there were on the western tip of the island. Again, there's going to be um, you know graphs and pie charts that they that, that all the data will then um, make available and to support that and you know. Um, as I was mentioning, it's, it's important to have that data, and it is the more accurate the data is, the more helpful it is. It's one of the things that we were talking about earlier, Hurricane Ike. The initial assessment of Hurricane Ike was based on a handful of people standing at the um, city hall and just truly making a guess. That number stuck with Galveston for the entire recovery. FEMA was either adding or subtracting from that number. And so, um, and the way that you can register is simply gedp.verdiims.com. And if you go to that um, URL, again, gedp.verdiims.com, there's a register link in the middle of that page. And with that, then you'll be able to create um, your username and password, and then the system will communicate back and forth with you and allow you to create the business. And with Brett's permission, we'll also send out an email to everyone here and so that, to give you that URL. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. So this is an initiative that the GEPD has, uh, has taken upon himself. I had a meeting with Jeff Sistrom. Most of you all remember him, or remember, know him with the city. Uh, he has been working with the, the, uh, the Office of Emergency Management to get this going. So it's, it's, a, it's a great initiative. It's something that uh, has been needed, has been needed, as, as uh, Keith said, for quite some time. So let me get, uh, let me get back in the thing. Sorry, I like to walk around when I, when I talk and engage, so I do apologize for having to to set still but if there's any questions on that uh, don't hesitate you can give me a call or email me and I can get you in touch with Keith or I can get you the information one other thing I would also like to note all these presentations will be sent to you after this meeting so you'll have all this so you have the information so don't worry about having to write down people's phone numbers or emails you'll get that at a later time so be you be focused on what we're doing okay so now we're gonna get into presentation we're gonna dive a little bit closer and a little bit deeper into what we're gonna do specifically here at the Port of Galveston uh, most of y'all know who I am in fact how many people have received my emails over the past concerning fog, hurricanes, anything? So, okay, good. Hopefully I'm not inundating you too much, but I'm sure in 2020 it probably was a little bit too much. But that will continue, and it means that it's working, so good. So one of the biggest things that, that, uh, that I focus on is communications. We like that in the, in the far distant past, but uh, not anymore. So for us, it's how do we communicate to you all? How do we get the information? How do we get the knowledge that I have? 
into your head so that you can develop your plan or you can go ahead and uh, develop what your next steps are going to be during any situation. But if you don't have that information and you don't have it timely, it's, no, it's not going to help you because you don't have it. You don't know what you don't know. So first thing that we did was we implemented about seven years ago the emergency notification system through Smart Notice. Um, it's something that I don't send out as much because this would be more for an immediate and imminent emergency. So it's something that you need to know right now. This is sent to you by text, it's sent to you by email, and also it gives you a call. So if this number, the 866-1419-5001 comes up on your phone, please save it. It's not spam. You know, I know there's a lot of spam going on. That's coming from me, or it's coming from the port, rather. So make sure that, that uh, you don't just disregard that, okay? And that's a way for us to push out real-time information immediate right there. You need to know now there's a busted gas pipe, there's uh, an accident, there's closure, something that you need to know right now. The other thing is it's not enough. It's not enough for me to send out an emergency notification text or email or the email blast that you just uh, stated that you get. There's also, let's say if you don't have your, your email up and running, your servers are down, you're not getting that, there's another way that you can find out what is going on at the Port of Galveston. That's through this number here. Like I said, you don't have to write it down. You'll get this later at a later time, but this number here will be updated. It'll be updated as needed. So this information provided as to, hey, gate 40 is uh, closed. New gate's going to be gate 15. Enter at that location. There's a, you know, whichever that is, you can contact that number. Now, that number is really only going to be in use during a hurricane situation or major disaster type situation on that, and we'll have that updated. So we can reach out to y'all, and y'all can also come back and reach out to us. And the wireless priority service. So this meeting is also set up for our staff as well. So one thing that we've had that I've taken the initiative, uh, again, about seven or eight years ago, is the uh, priority wired, uh, the wireless priority service. It's a uh, Department of Homeland Security program. It's for us to allow us to contact each other and put on a priority list um, whenever the phones are down because of the massive volume of calls. And usually you get that d d d. Sorry, the number you cannot be reached. This puts us on a priority. So. Um, that's more for us, but I just want to let our staff know that we still have that all our phones. Most of our phones are still registered for that. In fact, I just updated it to yesterday. Another way you can find out what we do is social media. Social media is extremely important. Twitter, Facebook. Uh, I don't know if we have Instagram or not, but we do. Perfect. Christina's back there. She manages that. We constantly meet uh, probably four or five times a day whenever there's an emergency, hurricane, fog, or whatever. She makes that makes sure that that is updated. Our Facebook, so if you don't like our Facebook, please go and like our page. We, we, we have a lot, so a lot of information on there. And, and some good trivia questions, too, there that I can't even answer, so they're pretty good on that. Port of Galveston <coughs> hurricane plans. All right, well, this is for our plan here, so I'm not going to touch much on this, but we do have a hazard uh, disaster recovery plan. Uh, there is a portion of that for uh, our hurricane plan. I do review that and update that uh, every year. Um, most of it does not change, but we do have one. That's internal for us. I just want to let y'all know that we do have that. Instant command systems, Coast Guard's very much aware of that. We do operate as instant command system. If you're not familiar with what that is, um, that is a program actually started by the fire department years ago. It was adopted, it's called NIMS, and this ICS is basically, and, and, and actually it came into play after 9-11. Um, because you had a lot of groups that were not coordinated together, uh, could not communicate together or function together. This brings everybody together. So we would have our own internal incident command system, which we would incorporate with the Coast Guard. They would take the lead on any situation like uh, a hurricane or emergency in this situation in the maritime industry. And we would have our organizational chart. We have that. We update uh, that at every year uh, as well. For hurricanes, if it's any other type of natural disaster or any other disaster, it will be tailored for that specific event. Hurricane plans. For the tenants here, uh, you are required to submit a hurricane plan. I do have most of them. I have been reviewing them. Most of it uh, is uh, redundant uh, from previous years. It's just making sure that you have your uh, contact information uh, um, uh, updated. That's the biggest part. Make sure you have that updated. And the good thing is, um, with this, is a lot of this stuff is um, 
is based on the port condition hours. It's, it's a great standard to have the 72, 48, 24, and 12 hours of whiskey, Yankee, Zulu, all that kind of stuff, so that you're staying consistent with what we're doing and what the Coast Guard is doing. So if you haven't got your plans in, get them in. If you need help, let me know. I have templates. So you just plug in your information and then send that to me. Preparation. So what, what can you do? You know, the last thing you want to have to do uh, whenever there's a storm that's popped up, just like we had last week, is trying to figure out what to do. There are a number of things that you can do right now. First thing you can do is just make sure that your place is clean, that you don't have debris laying around. If you have pallets, get the, pilot, the, the pallets out. You know, clean up, secure anything that you have. You know, do that at your house as well, because one thing that's going to be in your mind is, oh, i got to get home. i got to do this. I have to do that. Well, go ahead and do whatever you can now so you don't have to do it later. You know, so... The more you do now, the less you have to do later. So, but the big thing is make sure that you have your, your area uh, clean and also do any repairs. Any repairs you've been holding off on, go ahead and take care of those now. Now is be the right time, not a week before a hurricane. Uh, also, conduct a drill. Speak with your staff. Let them know what you're going to be doing. Review your plan with them. Let them know that, hey, if this happens, this is what we're going to do. You know, um, it's always good to have uh, everybody on your team understanding exactly what your next step is. So review that. Conduct a quick drill or an exercise. If you need help, I'll be happy to come to your premises and help you uh, facilitate a, a drill or an exercise. So. Evacuation. Let's see. I think it went too fast. Okay. We already went over this in the MSIB. Um, so we're, we've already done our facility uh, inspection um, on our end. Coast Guard will come in. They'll do their end. If they see anything, they'll let us know and we'll rectify that. But we've already had have done that. Evacuation. If you are to evacuate, you know, last year was one of the first times we actually did an evacuation. When we evacuate, we want to evacuate 24 hours before gale force winds. Okay, so that is uh, what Yankee. So whenever we, I send out that Yankee it has been um, issued by the uh, captain of the port, that's when we're going to have everything prepared. You know, we're going to give you plenty of time ahead of that to be aware of that. Yankee is going to be down the chain. Make sure. That, uh, that your premises is secured and you're ready to evacuate. The last thing we want is to have to have our personnel down there, our personnel down there uh, risking their life uh, basically for property. So we don't, that's not a good trade on that. So secure your premises, any hazmat, make sure that's removed. Uh, make sure that you're, um, you notify our, our dispatch center. The number's down here. Like I said, the number will also be on the slides that I send out. But many of you all are aware of this. That's our police department. Let them know, hey, this is Nick with, uh, with ADM. We're securing. Nobody's here. So when we do have our patrol on site, they know that nobody's in that facility. Okay. And a big thing, we are not a safe harbor. You would not believe how many calls we get uh, whenever a storm is approaching for a safe harbor. Uh, as you know, we're very limited on our berths. They are our prized possessions. Without those, we do not function. We are not a port. I do not accept vessels during storms. There are a few small occasions, but uh, other than that, we are not a safe harbor. I do not want to sacrifice uh, our berths uh, for, for a vessel where the safest place for them to do is leave, go south, go east, go west, whichever, to get out of the way till the storm is gone. So we do not. Uh, we do not uh, allow ships. And one, one thing I do want to mention really quick, um, many of y'all are aware, you know who I am, um, but also I have a, a tremendous staff. And my right-hand man standing in the back there with sunglasses, that's Jake O'Kelly. I'm sure most of you spoke with him on the phone or by emails, maybe not seen him in person. He's my right-hand man. He's a harbor master. He's, he, he'll be also in touch with everybody. And also his assistant, Matthew Robertson. So whenever this, this comes about, these, us three are going to be the main players you're going to be hearing from. Hurricane birthing agreement, we already went through this. Um, extreme circumstances will be allowed to remain at port. So uh, the whole point of this, we're not a safe harbor. No, don't go somewhere else. Not to be mean, but go somewhere else. Uh, port coordination team. Um, so I have a question. Nick, who is your port coordination team representative? That's right. So if you have any issues um, with your facility, with your vessels, I am the representative for the entire harbor, not just the Port of Galveston. So this includes Texas International, Gulf Sulphur, the Ferry, uh, Gulf Copper, uh, Halliburton, anybody else. I am the representative. So it's my duty to get information, provide to the Coast Guard Vessel Traffic Service, and for them to provide the information for me, 
pass back to y'all. That's basically the function of the Port Coordination Team is to keep the, the maritime community and industry up and running. So that is my whole job function as a representative. I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, it, the biggest issue with this is just keeping up with contacts. So if you have somebody that's leaving or you're being replaced, please send me their information so I can get them on my list. Opening up the port. So there's a few things we have to do to open up the port. It's very important. A lot of lessons learned from Hurricane Ike. The biggest thing is, well, wow, you know what? Uh, our channel and our docks, are, 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 is any of that safe? Can we bring vessels in? Well, no, you can't. You have to have surveys, hydrographic surveys. So there's a couple sets. The Army Corps comes in. They're going to survey the federal channel, which is basically everything down the middle of the channel. We coordinate with them. We also have contracts in place with hydrographic surveyors. In fact, we have, I think, three or four that we have contracts with to make sure they're down here so they can survey, survey our berths and survey our slips to make sure that they're safe, that there's no obstructions that actually fell off or there's any damage uh, down at the bottom that they can accept uh, the ships. We work hand-in-hand -hand with the Coast Guard. We are uh, with the Coast Guard, yes but with the, the pilots as well. Pilots set the standards on what vessels they will allow in based on the drafts of the ships. Most of the ships that we have are deep water ships, cargo ships, so therefore it's very important that we get that surveyed quickly and get that open. The captain of the port will be the first one to say, yep, you can open, and you'll get those in form of an MSIP as well, just like you would for Yankee and port conditions. So you'll get that as well, but we have to make sure we're, we get that done. Also, we'll be doing inspections of the site, the infrastructure, the laydown area, and, and everything else to make sure that that is still safe, that you can put cargo on. So there's a lot to it, but the good thing, as I said, preparation and planning is always key. So as long as we have our, our contracts in place, we know what we're doing, we're following our plan, we're doing everything that we can now, should be an easier and smooth process. Reentry plan, I'm gonna let uh, Chief Brown here in a second, and, and Kenneth Campbell, our Director of Safety and Security, speak on this here in a little bit. There was a plan in the past. It's currently in our hurricane plan to reentry, if you remember, during Hurricane Ike. You were allowed to come in, see, and then leave. It didn't all work that well. So, but it's very important for us to be able to get our superintendents and our managers to their site safely so that they can assess the damage they can take pictures and they can get that information to their insurance companies and their higher ups. The quicker that's done, the quicker we can get them up and running uh, and get the jobs back. So for us, it's very important that they're allowed to get in here. So we have set some po uh, policies and procedures and I'm gonna let the chief and Kenneth Brown get a little bit more detail into that. And that was a good lesson learned from Hurricane Ike as well. So big thing, are you ready? This is getting back into the island, if you remember. Um, that was Hurricane Ike. Um, Everybody, that's, I guess, now the, the new baseline for, you know, hey, everybody, this is what could happen. But it could be worse. That could have been a lot worse. That was just a Category 2, as they say. But even though it was a Category 4 for a long time, the storm surge, the wind wasn't that high compared to a Category 4. So the key to this is, are you ready? And I'm here for you. I work 24-7, 365. So does my team. So if you have any questions, you need assistance, you need help, uh, anything, you don't hesitate. You give us a call. Yeah, that, that is our job. So with that said, I am going to turn over. There's not an actual presentation for them. Here's my information. You should already have it. If you don't have it, you'll have this on the slide. If you have anything that you want to speak with me afterwards, I will be here. Um, and I do have some cards I can also pass out on here. But uh, the key is to make sure that you have my information and I have your updated information as well. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Kenneth Campbell, our Director of Safety and Security, and Chief Brown. And they're going to talk a little bit about not just a reentry plan, but a few other things, especially what we learned last year. So, thank you. Great. Good morning. Thank you all for coming out. We appreciate your time. Uh, it's a lengthy agenda. Uh, we know you've been here for some time, and uh, Director Reese still has an uh, uh, opportunity to get up and visit with you about the state of the port. Uh, what I briefly want to remind you of, uh, and really it's a request, is for your patience. Uh, we have some new safety and security protocols at the gates. So you may experience a little bit of delays. Uh, we take that very seriously. Without the port security, uh, we don't have anything else. So we do ask for your, for your patience at the gates. Uh, it's been touched on, so I won't reiterate it much, but the preparation is key. Uh, when the storms are imminent, uh, we need your site to be prepared and be uh, ready for that event. Uh, last minute uh, you know, notifications that you need to get some equipment on site, 
generators, et cetera, is a problem for us, we may or may not be able to get that personnel to you to, to open that gate. So we ask that you uh, be mindful of that and help us help you. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to invite the chief up, and he is going to discuss uh, the reentry. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, first thing I want to do is thank everybody for being here. You know, uh, hurricane season is is rough whenever we we have an event, and the best thing that we can do is be prepared. And preparedness starts right here in this room, and us being on the same page. So. Uh, it's important that, that you're in attendance, and I appreciate you being here. Uh, one of the first things I want to do is just let you all know about, about my team. We get asked all the time, uh, what are our business hours? Well, you know, the, our business office has regular business hours, but our police department is 24-7 like any other police department. Uh, you can reach us holiday, weekend, day, night. It doesn't matter. We have people here, um, and we're here for you. And in an event... Uh, like a hurricane, for example, is, is no different. We're going to have people here, and we're going to be here for you. Um, we, we prioritize by life first. Okay, Our first priority is pr uh, priority, uh, protection of life, and then after that, we worry about property. Um, it seems like uh, a lot of times we, we want to try to get that backwards because we, we have a lot of stuff out here that's valuable. Um, to all of you, our stakeholders have a lot of money invested in this port, and we understand that. Uh, but you can't put a put a value on life, and so understand coming from us that when it comes time to prioritize, we're always going to put life in front of property. Um, so property can be replaced, lives cannot. So with that, help us help you and, and be prepared. Um, whenever an event comes, we can't wait until the Coast Guard declares whiskey or X-ray to start getting ready. Uh, we start getting ready now. We know hurricane season is upon us, and we know what we've got to do to get our respective areas ready. Each one of your areas are, are unique and different, and so um, we can't make really blanket statements that apply to everybody, but you know what your area needs, and, uh, and, and so make sure that it's ready. If you need something from us, reach out to us. Uh, Brett has, has told you several times that his team is available, and, and he means that. So if you need something from the port, reach out to us. We want to help you guys be ready. But... Um, Brett talked about making sure your pallets and your areas are cleaned up. When, when the winds pick up to 100 miles an hour, those, those are missiles. Um, those can come flying through your facility, then come flying through my facility. Uh, my office is right next door, and I don't want one of those things coming through my window, and you don't want them damaging your facility. And so when, when a hurricane is, is 24, 48 hours out, that's not the time to start thinking about what do I need to do. Um, those are things that we can do all the time to make sure that we're ready. Because when the, the port director declares that we're going to shut this place down, we, we need you guys to be on board, have your facilities ready, and, and be ready to get out of here so that we can start doing what we need to do. Because as a police department, we can't do what we need to do until we make sure that all of the lives that are on the, the port are safe and gone. And then we can start doing what we need to do. So we're always going to be behind you guys. We're going to make sure that y'all get out first and that y'all are safe, and then we're going we're gonna to get out. Uh, we'll, be, we'll have somebody always on the island and be ready to uh, respond so that we can get out, uh, back out here on the port quickly after the event and, uh, and get this place back open for you guys as soon as possible. Um, but we're, we're always going to be a step behind you, so, so help us help you and, and be ready to secure your facilities uh, when the time comes. Um, and then lastly, uh, the reentry plan. All of our tenants have, have been given uh, the option of having two two people designated to get a reentry card. Um, if you haven't gotten that, come to the police department uh, or get, get with Brett, get, get your names on the list so that we know who to expect, and then get down to the police department. It looks very similar to your port ID card, but it's red in color, and it says, it says uh, emergency response, I think is what it says. If you don't have one of those cards, you're not going to be allowed in. Um, the purpose of those cards is not to get back to the port to start working. The purpose of those cards is to get back and start assessing your facilities, see what needs to be done, and then, and then get back out. Um, our, my team will be here. We'll make sure that you guys can get in safely. Um, and again, I stress safely. If we can't get you in safely, whether or not you've got that card, we're not going to let you in. Um, but assuming that we can get you in safely, we'll do so. And, and just be mindful that we don't need everybody uh, in your facility to have one of those entry cards. That's not to get back and, and start 
running cranes and running machinery and, and getting ships moving. That's not the purpose of that. The purpose is to come in and, and see what your facilities look like so you can start making your game plans. Um, the port likely at that point in time is not going to be open anyways for business. Uh, not for a while. We've got to do the hydrographic surveys and things like that that Brett talked about, and that takes some time to do. But we don't want to wait to let you guys come in and see whether you've got damaged equipment or, or anything like that. So make sure you get your reentry card if you don't have one. Um, every tenant, uh, with, with, with a couple of exceptions, is allowed two of those cards. So get your name on the list and get those, uh, get those cards updated. I've left a stack of my business cards right there. If, if uh, you want to pick one up when we're done, feel free to reach out to me or my team at any time, and we'll do whatever we can for you. Thank you.